Thomas Montgomery was a 47-year-old married New Hampshire man with two kids. He told none of that to tall, hot blonde, the 18-year-old he met in a Pogo chat room. He instead said he was a teenage Iraq war vet named Tommy, and the two hit it off. Tall, hot blonde, also known as Jesse, started sending gifts of erotic photos of herself. Thriving on the attention and cybersex, Montgomery bragged about his exploits to his friends, but everything fell apart when his wife found out. She sent Jesse a letter explaining that Montgomery was a middle-aged married man, one old enough to be her dad. Horrified, Jesse broke off the relationship, shifting her attentions to Montgomery's co-worker, 22-year-old Brian Berry. The switch didn't sit well with Thomas. The older man became violent, sending Jesse disturbing messages like, Brian will play in blood. And when Montgomery learned that Barry planned on visiting Jesse at her West Virginia home, a meeting Jesse canceled at the last minute, he decided Brian needed to die. On September 15, 2006, as Barrett sat in his car, Montgomery shot him sniper style with a 30 caliber rifle. When police learned about the love triangle, they decided to warn Jesse she might be next. However, when authorities arrived at Tall Hot Blonde's home, they found Mary Shiler, a middle-aged woman. Shiler had a daughter named Jesse, but the Jesse had never heard of Montgomery or Barry. It turned out the mom was leading a double life, romancing both men while posing as her teenage daughter. Police had no grounds for arresting Shiler, but they caught Montgomery, who was eventually sentenced to 20 years after a guilty plea. But Shiler didn't escape unscathed. Both her husband and daughter abandoned her, leaving a lonely catfish in a very bloody pond. Gerald Turner wasn't feeling well on Halloween night in 1973. He and his live-in girlfriend, Arlene Penn, had made plans to go to Arlene's mother's house that night for dinner. When Arlene got home from work though, Turner stopped her at the front door and urged her to go ahead without him. It was about 7 p.m. and Arlene shrugged it off and drove all the way to her mother's house before remembering that her mother wouldn't be home for nearly an hour. She went back home and wasted time downstairs with Turner for an hour, then went back out. When Arlene got home at 11 p.m., Turner was still up. She noticed that the blanket from their bed was crumpled up on the floor in the laundry room, but Arlene shrugged it off and went to bed. She didn't find out until later that the little girl from down the street had been killed in that same bed just hours earlier. Lisa Ann French left her house just before 6 p.m. dressed like a miniature hobo, rag jeans, a parka, and a battered felt hat. About an hour later, she made her way to Gerald Turner's house. The door was open. What happened next is unclear, but Turner got Lisa upstairs to his bedroom, where he forced himself on her and then strangled her to death. Then I see the daylight in your eyes turn to fear as I shut the door behind you. Gerald Turner later wrote in a letter he penned in prison to Lisa. The girl's body was found in a field on the outskirts of town three days after Halloween. The implications of the timeline are staggering. Had Turner already committed the heinous acts when Arlene got home from work, or was he still waiting for Lisa to come by? Had Arlene sat downstairs holding hands with a burgeoning killer while his first victim grew cold upstairs, or had Turner already put the body in a trash bag and dumped it? The jury couldn't have cared less. Turner was sentenced to 39 years in prison. Amid public outcry, he was released on parole in 1998, but he went back to prison in 2003 for a parole violation. Gerald Turner remains in prison to this day. Daniel Shaver was staying at a hotel on a business trip for his pest control company. 
he had been showing off an air rifle used to exterminate birds. A witness to this called the front desk and they contacted the police. Charles Langley, one of the responding officers, gave Daniel a series of bizarre and complex instructions to put his hands on his head, cross his legs, get on his knees while keeping his hands on his head and his legs crossed, and to make his way over to the police. While barking out the confusing orders, Langley constantly threatened Daniel with death. Langley said, listen to my instructions or it's going to become very uncomfortable for you. While the officer was yelling, Daniel was begging for his life. Please don't shoot me. The officer gave Daniel one final order to crawl toward him while keeping his hands in the air. But Daniel got on all fours and was crawling on his hands and knees. After this, a second officer, Philip Mitchell Braysfield, shot Daniel to death. Following an investigation, Braysfield was charged with second degree murder and a lesser manslaughter charge and found not guilty by a jury. Henry McElroy was the city manager of Kansas City, Missouri in the early 1930s. One late spring evening in 1933, his 25-year-old daughter Mary was bathing in her father's home when a gang of four masked men used a shotgun to force their way into the house. Mary and her kidnappers reportedly had a rather jovial conversation when the kidnappers demanded that she accompany them. She asked for time to finish her bath and get dressed. When they told her that they were going to demand $60,000, she replied, I'm worth more than that. Mary's captors held her in the basement of a farmhouse in Shawnee in nearby rural Kansas. Her father paid a negotiated ransom of $30,000 and she was released after a day and a night in captivity. Three of her four kidnappers were arrested over the next month. Mary suffered crippling shame and embarrassment after the kidnapping. At her captor's trial, she refused to cooperate with prosecutors. She publicly expressed sympathy for the kidnappers, even pleading successfully for clemency when the ringleader was sentenced to death. Her life after the kidnapping was very difficult. She suffered one nervous breakdown before the trial and several after. She eventually took her own life in 1940, leaving a suicide note in which she stated that her captors were the only people on earth who did not think she was a fool. James Sanders had a pretty sweet diamond ring. When he put it up for sale on Craigslist, he was hoping to bring in at least $1,000, money that might have helped out the family. After he received a reply to the ad, he invited the prospective buyers, a young married couple, over to his house in Edgewood, Washington, so they could have a look at the ring. But all was not as it seemed. When the couple arrived that night, Sanders was home with his wife and two sons, aged 10 and 14. He let the couple into the house. As soon as they were inside, however, the husband pulled out a handgun and ordered everyone to get onto the floor. While they tie up the Sanders family, two more armed men forced their way into the home. One of the new arrivals got rough and smacked Sanders' 14-year-old son with the barrel of his pistol. 
that was more than James Sanders could take. Wrenching himself free of his restraints, he dove at the man who'd hit his son, only to be shot three times. He died in his wife's arms in front of his terrified children. Three days later, a traffic stop in California led to the arrest of three of the suspects. Kiyoshi Higashi, Joshua Reese, and Amanda Knight. A few days later, the fourth suspect, Claiborne Beniard, turned himself in in the face of a massive statewide manhood. The four of them received sentences ranging from 79 to 123 years in prison. Els Clodemans and Els Van Doren share more than the same first name. These Belgian women also shared a lover, their skydiver instructor, Marcel Somers. The relationship was a tad awkward. Clodemans spent Fridays with Somers, and Saturdays belonged to Van Doren. There was a lot of friction between these ladies, and Clodemans took things especially hard. I always knew I was number two to Marcel, she once wrote, and their bizarre love triangle took a serious toll on her self-esteem. Clodemans wasn't exactly a healthy person, mentally speaking. Not only had she attempted suicide as a teen, but a psychiatrist would eventually describe her as psychopathic and narcissistic, rather unattractive traits in a girlfriend. Things finally boiled over in November 2006, when Van Doren showed up one Friday. Instead of sticking to the schedule, Somers took Van Doren to his bedroom, while Clodemans slept in the living room. That night, as she listened to the couple upstairs, Clodemans decided to act. On November 18, 2006, Somers, Clodemans, and Van Doren took off from an airport in eastern Belgium for a day of skydiving and fun. The plan was to jump simultaneously, everyone holding hands as they fell. Only Clodemans didn't jump in time. She hesitated, almost as if she wanted a view of the parachutists below. And when the three were about a thousand meters from the ground, Van Doren tugged on her chute and nothing happened. Panicking, she pulled the emergency chute and was horrified when it failed too. Plummeting at around 200 kilometers per hour. Van Doren smashed into someone's garden, ending up as a big heap of broken bones. Detectives suspected foul play when they found someone had cut the straps to Van Doren's parachute. When they decided to question Clodemans, the mentally disturbed skydiver tried to kill herself. Convinced she was their culprit, the police charged her with Van Doren's murder despite the lack of solid evidence. There weren't any fingerprints or witnesses, but Clodemans had the motive, the know-how, and a psychopathic mind. She also sent Van Doren anonymous letters and had barraged her with mysterious phone calls. Finally, in October 2010, Clodemans was found guilty and received 30 years behind bars. Unsurprisingly, she maintains her innocence. But if she didn't cut the cords, who did? <laughs>